Bingo, and we are live and recording. Hey, Bill, how's it going? <laughs> good. Good to see you. Good. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. My name is David Brownstein. Welcome to today's interview on the 2020 Music Industry Evolution Summit. My guest today is Bill O'Hanlon. Bill is a writer, a songwriter, and many other things, and I'm going to read you his short bio. Bill O'Hanlon has written and published 39 books, including one that got him on Oprah, Do One Thing Different, it was called, two on songwriting, song building, and a songwriter's guide to mastering co-writing, and he has coached several people to move their work online and bring in over a half a million dollars each, this is true, and he has also coached over 300 books from others into publication. Bill, thank you for being here. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Loving your hat, man. It's good. <laughs> it's, it's the, we, we met because we were wearing similar hats. That's at right. A event. That's right. I've met a lot of people because they started talking to me about my hat. I realized that if I wore a hat at a party, I was going to meet a lot more people. And I, I was glad you didn't wear yours today so we didn't look like twins. <laughs> Also, the hat, it's hard to with the hat with my headset, it too. It is, it is hard with the headset. Um, this is why I started, when I DJ, I base, backwards baseball hat for that. It nice. looks very cool, but also I can see stuff. Too. Anyhow, um, so here's what I want to talk about today. So, Bill, tell us about your background a little bit. Just how did you, what's your journey? How did you get from where you started to where you are today? Let's just start there a little bit. I'll tell you the shortest version that I can do. I was, um, uh, when I was a young guy, I got depressed. I got, in fact, suicidally depressed. Friend talked me out of killing myself. I got very interested in, wow, how did, how did I get to that place and how did I get out of it? And um, all sorts of stuff about the mind. I became a psychotherapist. I went and got my master's degree, became a therapist. And on the way there, I met a guy who was an amazing guy, a guy named Milton Erickson, who inspired, if some of you know, neurolinguistic programming, who inspired, it was part of the inspiration for neurolinguistic programming uh, back in the day. But I studied with him directly. He was an amazing guy. And he had this very positive view of people. He had a view, instead of focusing on what people's diagnosis and what messed them up, he focused on their resources, assets, and strengths, and abilities. And so that really influenced me. I was studying that on the way to getting my master's degree. I was studying with him. And I frankly got upset about the state of psychotherapy when I started to practice professionally because almost all my colleagues were focused on what was wrong with people, just coming up with the best diagnosis they could. And then it was less interesting afterwards. And so I was like, wow, if I'd gone to one of these people, they were so focused on what was wrong, I might have done myself in. I got, frankly, I got pissed off. And at a very young age, really in my mid-20s, and I was super shy, I started to go out and teach Milton Erickson's approach and related approaches that were based on strengths, abilities. And I was so passionate about it, they overcame my shyness. I was also a musician in those days, and I... I, I faced a, a, you know, a turn in the road. Am I going to go for music or am I going to go for psychotherapy? And in those days, I thought, well, I could help a lot more people with psychotherapy. Actually, I've changed my mind about that. Music is much <laughs> yeah. more, much more yeah. universal. It's yeah. in yeah. every culture in the world. And when yeah. I'm yeah. hurting, happy, sad, you know, need inspiration, need to connect with other people, music is where I go. So, but whatever, I made that choice back in the day. And I started traveling around the world, much to my surprise, because there was a great interest in what I was talking about, teaching workshops. I ultimately ended up giving over 3,500 talks all around the world. I know you've traveled a lot. We kind of follow each other in our travels. And, um, and I ended up, after 10 years, people would come up to me, where's your book? I go, oh, no, 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 I can't write a book. I have no idea how to write a book. After a bunch of years of people bugging me, I wrote my first book, th three years, blood on the keyboard. I hated every minute of it. I loved to have written, though, and it was pretty fun when it was out. <laughs> and then I wrote another one the next year, and it took me only nine months. And then I kept writing once a year, and I looked up, and right now I just finished my 39th book. I'm working on my 40th one. And as you said in the bio, I've because people would come up to me, hey, how do I write a book? I started an online course uh, after many, many years of being on the road. I thought, 
I am so tired of being away from home. Musicians can relate. Um, you know, and I'm on the road three or four times a month for three or four days. I barely have a home life and I'm neglecting my friends and my loved ones, my family. And I got to figure out a way to do this work that I love and stay home. So I created an online course about how to write a book and get it published. As you mentioned, I was on Oprah, so I had a little credibility. I coached friends to write books and one of my friends got a, a $75,000 advance when I coached him. He'd never written a word and I was like, wow, not only did it work for me, but it worked for somebody else. You know, I guess I could do this. I knew the whole world was going online. This was about 12 years ago. And 10 years ago, I got really serious and I learned about how to market online courses. And I started making so much money, I really didn't have to travel anymore. And ultimately, although I'd been a terrible steward of my money, I was always in debt, always <laughs> overspending in my life. I paid off all my debts, including after a few years, my mortgage. So I had no more debts. I started to suck money into savings to retirement, again, which I hadn't had too much um, before. And I saved basically enough to live the rest of my life. And all of a sudden, the old dream of becoming a songwriter, um, I didn't want to travel around the world and be a musician or a DJ like you are. I wanted to stay home and home now is two places. I'm talking to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, but I also have a second place uh, where I live with three other songwriters in Nashville. And um, I was started going there every month and staying in hotels got expensive. So I decided to rent a place and I started writing songs seriously. And I just, it was like, I, you know, I went to graduate school for being a psychotherapist. So let me ask you this, how did you, how did you make the shift from writing all these books to really committing to your songwriting process and how, what did you apply from, from that process to writing, to writing songs? Well, I mean, one other thing, you know, I, I was a lazy guy when I was younger. I was a hippie boy and I did not want to work very much. And I developed a work ethic over the years. And one of the things I learned from, from writing books was you rarely feel like writing a book, or at least I don't. Some people love to write. <laughs> I think I, I'll write a book today. Right? That's right. <laughs> I love to have written, as I joked. Yeah, yeah. Parker joked from way back, but I love to have written. I didn't like to write. Now I actually don't mind writing so much. It's a lot easier. I got better at it, but I discovered, you know, who cares what you feel like in the moment? Just go do it, and then the inspiration starts to show up. I, a thousand people have said that, you know, many, many, you know, I'm, you know, I, I don't wait for inspiration. I sit down and put in the perspiration, and the inspiration comes. And when I got to, you know, when I had finally enough money and enough time, because I used to be pedal to the mental busy, I would look at my iCal on my app hole, and all of a sudden it would have weeks with nothing on the schedule. And I was like, this is so great. And the thing that filled that in was music and starting to go back to songwriting. And then I got serious and I thought, well, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to, I'm going to make this a quicker journey than my journey in writing books and becoming a speaker and becoming a therapist was. I'm going to go to graduate school with the best songwriters I can find. I'm going to, because I, money wasn't so much of an object, I'll go to their workshops. You and I met at a music conference. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then we saw each other at another one a few months later. And um, so I went to music conferences, some of which were a waste of time, some of which weren't, but networking. And all of a sudden, Nashville started calling. It was either L.A. or Nashville. I was a singer-songwriter back in the day. I thought, nah, that Nashville story song is a little closer than the pop music. And plus, you can see by the hair, I'm a little older. And they don't care how old you are in Nashville pop music is mostly a young person's game. So I went to Nashville and started networking. And one of the ways I networked is I found, I found that, as you know, and, and as almost everybody watching this summit <laughs> knows, songwriters are making way less money than they used to make back in the day when you can make so much money by album sales or CD sales or cassette sales. And, you know, mechanicals were worth a lot and songwriting royalties were worth a lot more. Now, I knew songwriters that had made a lot of money in the 80s and the 90s or the early 2000s, and they were barely scraping by. And I thought, you know, I'm learning how to write a song from you. You ought to write a book about how to do it. You ought to do an online course. And I sort of sneaked past the velvet rope where they keep all the wannabes out. And it got in with some pretty amazing songwriters. 
and I taught them how to do online courses and how to market online courses. So you said in the intro, you know, I helped some amazing people who should have been making way more money because of their talent than they were. And that's, you know, when you and I talked, I thought, boy, I'd love to be on this summit and tell musicians how to get a baseline of an of a income so they can do the music they love and forget trying to, you know, do stuff just for money in their music because music is such a crucial thing in the world and letting your creativity flow, you got to keep your eye on the commercial marketplace, but having a baseline of income so you can pursue the muse wherever she leads you, I think would be so cool for musicians. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, let's get into that. And I guess, you know, as, as the uh, pandemic uh, world has shifted, many musicians were making maybe decent livings on the road or maybe subsistence level livings on the on the road or in coffee houses so i mean i've been, I've been having conversations with other people about this like on one level people that were touring were making money while they were touring but then they get off the road and they go now how am i going to make any money right so in a way all the money is gone from touring on the other hand were people really making money from touring you know if people were in a in a back line of a, of a tour or if there were sets and musicians there was they were making decent money but maybe not consistent so there's a different focus and different highlight now on uh sustainability of of money and that's what was exciting to me about what you're doing with these books and this and this new stuff well i think one of the keys you know again i was a hippie and i'm like oh money is evil i don't want to know about money and of course i spent all my time thinking about money when i didn't want to know about it, because it was noisy. <laughs> leave me alone with this money stuff <laughs> my old sob kept breaking down that somebody yeah. get to Hawaii and couldn't take it. And it yeah, just was yeah. terrible. I had no money and would just stay on the street because I had no money. And after a while I thought, I gotta if I gotta be on the planet, you know, and, and do this with these normal people, I gotta figure out money. So, right, you know, right. one of the things is that most people, and you know, you talked about people being on the road and you trade time for money. And that is you can only do so much of that, even if you make $250 an hour, we're in the US, 250 US an hour, there's only so many hours in the day that you can do that. And so to me, one of the keys to success, and I started this when I was doing book writing is develop sources of passive income and songwriting when it pays or mechanicals when they pay from your recordings, licensing your recordings can be part of that passive income. You put in the work up front, you make an amazing thing, other people like it, they'll license it from you, and boom, you get passive income. The sync placements these days yeah, are a more yeah. lucrative source for a lot of people. A lot of musicians are going for that. Also book writing, you know, I wrote books and I still get money from books I wrote in the 1980s. That'll tell you how, that'll carbon date me and tell you how old I was, <laughs> I, how old I am, but um, I still get money. Sometimes I just got an $8,000 check from a book I wrote in the late 90s. Um, just unexpectedly, $8,000 came in. And I get paid every six months, typically for my royalties with book writing. And so I thought, how do you set up, how do you figure out how to separate time from money as a musician? And the main way that the, the most massive, it's either massive or passive income to me. The most massive way I ever brought in money was online courses. And I just figured out something that I knew that other people wanted to know and they were willing to pay me money. And I gave away as much free stuff on the front end so I could develop credibility and help people without charging any money back to my old hippie days. And I like to contribute and live in you know abundance rather than scarcity. But then ultimately when they got to know me, like me and trust me, and I'd given them so much value for free, when I said, hey, I got this course, if you wanna go deeper into how to write a book and you need somebody to hold your hand and coach you, people would pay me money for it. And after a while, I was stunned how much money. I learned marketing methods where I would sometimes bring in a couple hundred thousand dollars in a week. And I was like, what? How can that wow, wow. be? And when I went to Nashville and saw these starving musicians or just subsistence level musicians who were doing okay, going out on tour, going on the road, making an okay living, but they were working their buns off and they weren't getting ahead and they had no retirement, no savings. I thought, I'm gonna teach some of these people who have these amazing things to teach the world. One of the first guys was a guy named Michael Elsner who 
is an amazing, he had 2,000 sync placements, and I was talking to him one day, he played some guitar in a session for one of my songs, and I saw he was into self-help books, and I had written some, and we got in a conversation, and I said, and he was telling me, I have this four-step method for getting sync placements, I was like, what? I want to know that. And then when he told me, I was like, you got to create a course, dude, and he was like, what? I never, wow, how would I do that? And I said, I know exactly how to do that. So I coached him to do it. And he's on track for seven figures this year, um, you know, seven figure income. So, yeah, I, sp I spoke to Michael the other day. He's going to be part of the summit. I'm really excited to be sharing yeah, the I, things that he's sort of, learned I, I and because he's an amazing guy. Yeah. And, and the things that you've, you've helped him find a process to make a lot of a lot of cash. What's I mean, I think also what's interesting in this current post ish pandemic world is the the infrastructure has been in our houses and our laptops and in our phones and all the online tools have been he developing under in this un ecosystem, not hidden from view, but their, their importance is highlighted now. So the kinds of things that you're talking about and that Michael's talking about, and there's, it's, there's a high, greater necessity right now. And it's just already in our homes. Now we're locked in our homes with our tools. So musicians have, an opportunity to just go, well, I'm stuck here at home. Let's make some money. Let's make some music. Musicians are more ready for this kind of thing than anybody I know because they know That's how to I think. use electronic recording tools. Video is a little different from audio, but some of them are doing videos themselves. But as you know, I mean, I've seen your traveling rig where you go DJ around the world. The Beatles would have died to have something like that. <laughs> you know? right. Wow, yeah. you know, we could bring it to India and we could do a full-scale recording in India while we're there. <laughs> They had to wait to go back to England to do the real recording. You can bring <laughs> right. your recording with it. It's amazing. It can be on a phone. You know, we've seen some amazing things done on a phone. I, I think this is the golden era. And, you know, the key for me is people will pay for information that moves them from point A where they are to point Z where they'd like to be. You know, getting cuts learning how to write a better song. I paid a lot of money for that for, for great songwriters, happily yeah. paid it. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, how to produce, how to become a DJ, whatever knowledge you have, uh, how, to, how to record a basic track. If you're a singer-songwriter and just need a guitar vocal. A lot of, a lot of you know, songwriters are so intimidated by the technology. But again, musicians who have knowledge have the tools right at their hands. They're not going to have to invest a lot of money. Now, you probably do have to invest a little money into an online platform. I have a particular one I use. And, you know, for me, it costs me a couple hundred bucks a month. If I opened a real business on Main Street, which is hard to do these days um, because nobody will come to it because they're so afraid of getting infected, you'd have to spend a lot more money just for rent for the month. But you can mm -hmm. basically set up your whole business for three or 400 bucks a month. It's amazing. Well, what are some of the business mind not just the mind shifts, but just the, what are the ways that musicians, I mean, what are some ways that people can just start thinking about this differently, start seeing if there's a course in them, uh, what's their, ex, I don't know, just where, how, would, how would you start conceptually? You know, you and I talked about this because I see musicians doing this. They create songs, which are great, you know, or the music, which is great. And then they go, come to my website and sign up to follow me and I'll give you a free song. And I'm like, ugh. There's free music all over the place. That's not that valuable. And, and there's so much noise out there. You, once you discover an amazing musician, of course, you love them and you want to hear more stuff from them. But until you know them and like them and you've seen them live or somehow somebody's turned you on to them, they don't want a free track from you. They don't have the time or the attention. So grab them with something that's valuable, something that solves a problem for them, gives them value, does something that they don't know how to do and they really want to know how to do and give it away. And again, back to my hippie days, living in abundance. I love that the digital world allows me to create a free ebook on how to start writing your book, you know, jumpstart writing your book and come up with a best-selling title. And, you know, I can give that away. I used to charge money for it because I have to do coaching and take my time. Now I can create a little ebook. They can download it and they exchange their email, which is what they're giving. They're giving their time and attention, and they're giving me access to their email to email them again or joining my you know, Facebook group or follow me on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. They're connecting with you because you've got something of value for them. So, I mean, that for me is the first step. It, and I still use email, even though it seems old school. 
I have I started out with 600 emails when I started this, and now I have 46,000 emails uh, in various niches that I, you know, I write books and I was a speaker, so I've taught people to do those things. I was a psychotherapist, so I have some clinical stuff. And um, being here, I'm starting to build a songwriters, musicians, producers list and you know getting known to that and i'm doing this you're paying me the princely sum of zero and uh and yeah as you're paying everybody exposure man exposure, yeah, exposure yeah. <laughs> no, no, but for me that's the key exposure yeah you can't pay rent with exposure but exposure plus connection to an email when somebody will give you an email that now becomes an asset that i can turn exposure and visibility and credibility into income well, you know, I, I mean, it's the old joke of playing or for free in a restaurant for expo in exposure. But what the truth is, it's about developing relationship. It's developing trust. It's developing familiarity, right? And I mean, a lot of artists now, after their shows, they'll do a merch table where they're signing or they'll do some hello. So it's it's building relationship in a certain kind of way and and speaking here and there and all these elements. People see you for free online. They get to know how you think. They get to know who you who you are and how you, how you who to trust and what, right. who's I got credibility. Right. I think that's right. And then for me, even though there's social media, I want to move them from those social media platforms onto something because Mark Zuckerberg owns those, you know, or, you know, whoever they own those things. And at any moment they could kick you off if you violate their policies or they change their policies or that that thing could go out of business. You and I both are old enough to remember that there was a music platform that a lot of people built our careers on when we were coming up. I I think it may still exist, but I don't know anybody that's on it, right? And so those things can become obsolete. My email list, I've transferred it three or four times to different services because I own that. So I start to build up assets. And for me, assets are like music, tangible things that you put down in a fixed form, a copyrightable form. So it's eBooks, it's audios, it's videos that are full. And then my email list and then relationships. That's an asset. Building so for me, it's, you and I have a relationship and we draw upon each other every once in a while for something. I had you do a production for me. You know, you, right, you right. would call me up every once in a while, pick my brain on something. And now we're doing this summit together. Yeah. Relationships are an asset too. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, every time I go out to go to a networking event or to a workshop or, a, or an event, and maybe I have, I think it's going to be about this, but it ends up being about somebody I met in a random elevator conversation or a drink or dinner. Or because we wore the same hat. Same hat. It's definitely wardrobe is an important <laughs> part of, of yeah. the deal. Big part of networking. No, I don't <laughs> it, it is. It is. Random. It seemed random. <laughs> well, so if you're if people are looking to create um, a program, do they have to keep a separate identity? Or how does that play with their artist identity? Let's say a singer, songwriter, or, or always, a writer. Always a judgment call for me. Um, always a judgment call. But to me, the first thing is creating a valuable giveaway that you would have charged money for, and you don't, you don't charge money, but you charge connection and trust and permission. So they're going to give you their email. You don't abuse that, and you do that. The second thing, and for me, my first book took three years. My second book took, took nine months. Why? Because I outlined the heck out of that second book. And I taught a workshop on it 10 times before, mm -hmm. 50 times before I did the book. The first one I was working it as I went. So for me, figure out what you know and then make a really good title, subtitle, and outline and then get a coach and a mentor, you know, that's one of the things you do. And uh, I used right. to do, I don't do much anymore. I do it for friends, but I don't do it as a living because I have enough, but, and I want time is a more valuable asset to me than money at this point, but find a mentor, find a coach, someone who's been here already and knows how to do this, who can walk you through it and save you boatloads of time and money mistakes that you might make. Um, so that's what I'd be doing. And I'd be thinking, what do people always ask me? Like, what do they ask you? To, you know, like, how do I become a DJ? How, how do I make beats? I mean, I go on, my beats sound boring. How do you do those cool beats I heard you? You know, what, if people start asking you this stuff and you go, well, it's easy, you know, and then it's easy for you, but not for them. 
I have a friend who created a whole course, and I think you're going to talk to her or have yeah, yeah. Um, on for songwriters how to do a basic demo, even if they're totally intimidated by the technology. And yeah. because I had so many songwriter friends who said, you know, I said, well, will you do guitar, vocal demo? And they go, well, I, I can do it on my phone, but it's going to sound like crap. And I go, well, just, you know, do it on your computer. Just, you know, get a microphone, you know, put it in your... It's not that hard to do a guitar vocal demo. They go, yeah, I've never done it. I'm freaked out by it. All right. And so when I met this uh, person, Chris Bradley, I said, you got to do a course on this because people are so freaked out and you're good at explaining it in baby steps. And she's like, really? You think people would? And I, yes, people would. Mm -hmm. Please do that. And, you know, I've sent a bunch of people to her course and they've loved her, you know. So figure out something that people want to know that's valuable and that for you, not it's not like second nature but it's something you know how to do and you could help other people do it no, that's great well as an example of your methodology let's let's actually talk about your free gift and the download that we're offering now and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about how you're collaborating online because i mean you've done such a good segue i'm like let's just go right into it because i want to just i want to pitch i want to not, not pitch it it's free uh it's but free. i, I, I as long as you're on a roll, I want to hear you talk about it. Um, so tell us about what your gift is going to be. Well, you know, I, I, it was a little challenging, you know, kind of like learning your DAW to record songs, a little challenging to learn the technology of how to create a course and how to put it online. But it wasn't that challenging. I mean, there are platforms out there that are for dummies at this point, and they're pretty easy to use. When I started, it was a lot harder. Now it's a lot easier. But here I was a psychotherapist and like most musicians, not trained in advanced marketing. In fact, I had it like money. I had an antipathy towards marketing. So I, but I thought I've got something I really want to get out in the world and I want to have a life. I don't want to have, be busy all the time. I want to free up my money. So I went and studied with the best internet marketers and they were selling how to make money and they were making millions of dollars online. I'm like, they're making millions of dollars with this stuff and I'm changing people's lives. I mean, my, some of my stuff is psychotherapy stuff that really can, you know, help people not kill themselves. And I'm thinking, and I'm making hundreds of dollars, thousands, you know, many thousands. <laughs> and so, you know, I released a course and it earned like 9,000. I was pretty happy, but that wasn't going to change my life. And I went and learned this marketing stuff and I started to earn a couple of hundred thousand when I would do the same thing I was doing before. I just knew how to market it better. And so what I've done for my free giveaway is I've done a 48 minute, I tried to make it as short as I could, but that's how long it came out. A 48 minute webinar with a brain dump of everything I learned in those three or four years when I was learning how to create and market online courses successfully. And when I just freed up my time and made enough money so I didn't have to work anymore. Um, and, you know, what you, what you give up for that is your email because I want to support my friends who are doing music courses. So I'll write you afterwards. And this is called Permission Marketing in Seth Godin's words. If you give me your email now, you can opt out at any time, unsubscribe at any time. But hopefully, if I'm good at what I do, I will send you some follow-up stuff that is going to help you even more than that first 48 minute webinar. So that's what I that's got. great. That's great. So just just to clarify everyone, you'll, you'll you there's a there's a link in the email you got to get you to here today, you can download that you can get bills free download and uh, sounds like this 48 minute video, which I'm excited to see myself. Good. Um, I've, I've studied with a number of internet marketing people, or at least I've bought their books and tried to read them and I just got bored. But when I've been speaking with Bill about it. Um, he makes it clearer, he makes it easier, he makes it more actionable. And he's got the, an artist, therapist, loving person's soul. So I don't feel like I'm being like garden hosed, or fire hosed with yeah, bullshit. Sometimes after I meet these people that are so slick and so, you know, sleazy to me, I feel like I have to take a shower and with a lot of soap to get the grease off me. You know, it's I know, I know, but there's something, there's something in it. And for, for musicians yeah. to find a way to do passive yeah. income and, you know, to support your, your music habit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the old joke. How do you, how to make a, a million dollars with an airline, start with $2 million. How do you make a million, <laughs> million dollars as a musician? Start with $2 million, which is really great. I went to Nashville, you know, all my friends who are songwriters are playing, right, driving Uber and Lyft and being bartenders and waitresses and waiters. And I'm like, hey, you know, 
this is great. I just get to write songs full time if I love it, and I do love it. So it's yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's great. If you got a few more minutes, I'd love. I know you're doing a lot of writing these days, and I know you're doing a lot of collaboration writings on uh, Zoom and whatever it's, or rather Google, whatever Hangouts is. Tell me a little bit about how that's been for you. What's what's coming out of? I mean, everybody is trying to write these days online how's how's that process been what's been different about collaborating online with your songwriting partners well i mean i love the in-person energy exchange and you know the back and forth that happens the tools online are getting a little better when i started i started on skype and it was like glitchy and you know not very good quality look at you and you and me at this point First of all, both of us are musicians, so we've got a setup that sounds a little better than right, most right. people. But so I have to coach some of my co-writers who are technically inept. Of come on, you know, do this setting and you know plug your plug your mixer into it. You know, I, I want to hear you when you're playing. And so I think that's the first thing is um, right the technical stuff. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just getting the technical stuff because the time lag is sometimes the delay is just too much. I think in a year or two, it's going to get better and faster and it's going to be easier to do it. Some of my Nashville songwriter friends with, uh, that always wrote in person are like, hmm, this online thing isn't so bad. I don't have to get up and drive 20 minutes through bad Nashville traffic or 30 minutes through bad Nashville traffic to go down Music Road to write. This, maybe I'll continue this after this thing stops. So I think that's one of them. You know, the other thing is never miss an opportunity. I've written the last couple of books I've written have been about songwriting because I, I vowed I would stop writing books. After I wrote 36 books, I'm like, that's enough for any human being. I get to Nashville and I meet some hit songwriters who want to write books. Two of them were Marty Dodson and Clay Mills. And we wrote the song. I got mine right here. There you go. To <laughs> mastering co-writing. And then Marty Dodson and I wrote one on lyric writing, which is um, song building and, uh, you know, mastering lyric writing. And, um, and we're writing another one on melody writing. I'm writing with Clay Mills. So I think learn the etiquette of co-writing because you know some people only wrote songs on their own. That's what I did before I went to Nashville. There's an art and an etiquette and a way to make sure that, and just like in any other realm of life, to communicate clearly about expectations before, during, and after a co-write. And, and it's like dating. I mean, there are some people, you've you got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the people that really click with you. And I write with people that I never met before I did this, one of whom, one of whom two of whom, I've only written with by, in distance for the last two years. And we write songs in an hour. There's just mm, something mm. that clicks about our relationship. And you just don't know. And then other people, we come out with good songs, but maybe it takes us two days, you know, two full days of writing over time or whatever. And so finding those right people and finding people that are fun to work with too. I mean, I end up laughing so much in my co-writes because I, you know, I think lightening up the situation often makes creativity flow. Now there's some people that are just clowns and you can't get a song done with that, but a little lightening up is pretty fun. And find people who are fun to write with that complement your skills and that know how to use their Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I've, I've done some co-writes with uh, some people that I've written with a, in person, and we were able to naturally go to three of us in different uh, Skype It does help if you've had that in-person contact, even just a conversation, so you know that person. But, I mean, it's a whole new world, and... I'm totally fine. I'm writing. I, I just finished my 98 song of the year. We're in uh, May here. We're in mid-May. And um, I'm wailing on it. I'm doing two or three songs a day. That's sort of the Nashville way. It's not the LA way. Um, yeah. But <laughs> it's cool to, you know, just, I love writing songs. I'm a bit addicted to it. That's great. That's great. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Anything else you want to add? Uh, I think we can... Uh... You know, for me, again, coming from the old hippie place, I did have this sort of new age abundance thing and online digital stuff. I mean, what you're doing with this whole summit is an illustration of this. The cool thing about digital is you can give it away and you can make it very affordable, if not give it away. And then there's a way to monetize that. So you can both be living in generosity and abundance and you can make a good living. So for me, digital world is kind of coming full circle from my old hippie days of 
let's let everybody, you know, have universal basic income, basically. And this is <laughs> your way of not waiting for the government to get with it, but get your own universal basic income so you can do the art and the music and put yourself out. I mean, like during this time of people in lockdown, what are they going for? Music, movies. Music, yeah. They're going yeah. for art. They want art, you know, and they want connection too, which is another thing music does. So find a way to support yourself and go out and do the music and put it out in the world. Well, so uh, what would your hippie self say to you now? I can't believe you. You have short hair, number one, <laughs> during this pandemic. Uh, number two, I never thought you would have any money. So, uh, you know, that's a little weird. But you don't look like you sold your soul, so I guess you're okay. And it's cool that you have so much money you can give back now. I mean, I have musician friends in Nashville who, once they lost their gig, couldn't pay their rent. I have money. I said, hey, nobody starve or not pay your rent. Contact me. I will help you. And so it's nice to be able to give back and have more than enough, actually, not just in my spiritual life and, and mine, but actually I have enough in my bank account so I can help other people. I've been, I love that. And so my hippie self would bless that, I think. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say, he also say, far out, man. <laughs> far out, man. I, I, I heard a terrible joke, you know, like, why didn't the lifeguard uh, rescue the hippie? Is it because he was too far out? Too far out. <laughs> Sorry, terrible dad joke. That's a dad joke. <laughs> Somebody said it to me. The other day, All right, so yeah, that's good. I, that's good. So uh, Bill's free gift is called Blueprint for Building a Profitable Online Business, a free 50-minute webinar walking musicians through the steps for creating a successful and profitable online business. So uh, thank you so much, Bill, for being here today. Thanks for having me. I can't wait till we can see each other in person, and I can't wait till we co-write. I am looking forward to that myself. And All any right. of you, if you have some questions, you can um, – Send them to me. Send them to Bill. Maybe on the on our uh, Facebook group for the for the summit. Um, we're looking to you know curious to hear what your takeaways are, what your questions are, and we're looking to have as much interaction and conversation on the Facebook group as we can. So please please say hello there. Thanks for watching. I hope you got some new information. Check out Bill's free gift, and that's it for today's summit meeting. See you all soon. <laughs> And see. Stop cloud recording. 